Well, thank you very much. And welcome, everyone, to the uh, Institute for American Values Center for Public Conversation. Uh, we have, are going to have a very exciting evening, I think, of lots of lively conversation tonight with Professor Ralph Richard Banks uh, of uh, Stanford Law School. Tell me a little bit, tell all of us, a little bit about your personal life, because when I read the book, I have to be honest with you, I had some su assumptions of who you might be mm -hmm. and all of that, okay? okay? So tell everybody, like, where were you born? Well, there are just, just kind of fill in the blanks. Okay, there are a couple questions that come up all the time. Uh, one, which is come up on, comes up on radio in particular, is my race. As one might guess, I'm African American. Uh, the other is whether I'm married, and I am. Uh, and the third is the race of my wife. Uh, she's African American as well. And we, uh, we actually met in elementary school uh, with the gentleman who's sitting here, a uh, friend of mine who's here, also from Cleveland. Uh, we grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, I went to Stanford for undergrad, did a master's degree while I was there in educational policy. Um, worked some in education and as a journalist and went back to Harvard for law school, graduated in 1994 uh, and clerked for a judge and did a what fellowship. What judge did you? Uh, Barrington Parker. Oh, so second who's circuit? A, who's a, when he was on the Southern District actually. Southern, okay, uh, okay. Who's now a judge on the Second Circuit okay, uh, okay, here. Okay. And I, um, so I clerked for Judge Parker uh, and then followed my wife around for a job a little bit uh, and then we were fortunate enough to end up back at Stanford where I teach in the law school and she teaches in the psychology department. Now, you're 46 years old. How long? Oh, no, that's, come on. 47? <laughs> How old okay. are you? How old are We'll you? cut this later. You're, you're close enough. You don't enough. want your age to be. You're close enough. Okay, close okay. enough. Right. You're okay. mid-40s, I suspect. I'll Very young. I'll take it. Okay. okay. Um, I'll take it. How long have you been married? Uh, since, now that you're asking a tough question, since 1997. Okay. So we married in 1997. We have three boys, uh, eight, nine, and thirteen. Okay. okay. And the eight-year-old just struck out two batters. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. First no, time that you, happened. You have no girls. No girls. Okay. Okay. Um, so tell me, what brought you to the whole study of marriage? I mean, why did mm -hmm. you? Why are you interested in the study right. of marriage, and then the study of marriage among African Americans? Right. Right. So this is also a question I've thought about a lot, uh, and I had a my typical answer would be, well, this is the area that I research and I teach family law. Uh, I teach a number of courses related to race in the law, employment discrimination, some constitutional law about the 14th Amendment. No, but that's lawyers the blah, out here. blah, blah. I mean, and that's what, the blah, what, blah, yeah. blah, right. I mean, what in your heart? So that's my answer, okay. right? But okay. as I reflect on it, I mean, I, I think that I realized that I actually was concerned with issues related to families when I was in college even uh, and wrote papers about single parent families, two parent families, and what was happening with families. And I think it probably ultimately goes back to my own experience uh, that my mother died when I was nine. So I went from a two parent family to a one parent family. And it was a pretty stark uh, divide. Uh, I see. So I had that experience with two parents and then uh, had the experience with one parent. Did your uh, father remarry? He did not. Okay. He did not. And he, and he did not remarry in part. I mean, he had girlfriends over the years. Uh, but he didn't remarry in part because he felt that he had a commitment to his children and he didn't Interesting. want to uh, sort of bring someone else into that situation. Now, how many uh, brothers and sisters did you have? And I have three older sisters. Okay, so he... Uh... Well, they were actually gone. Actually, my two oldest sisters were, were gone. <clears throat> oh, this is rare that I don't speak loud enough. My two older sisters were gone. Uh, my two older sisters were, were going to college, uh, and so I was in the house with my one sister who was five years, six years older than me. Uh, and then one of the sisters came back for a little while. She finished her last year of college locally um, to help out. Uh, and then she subsequently got a job in Los Angeles and moved to Los Angeles. Uh, so we had a lot of help. I mean, we had, you know, we had a aunts and uncles and cousins and family okay. members nearby. So it wasn't as though we were completely on our own, but then again, I mean, there weren't a lot of home-cooked meals, shall we say. Um, okay. Uh, I had enough fast food as a child to last a lifetime. Well, was your father a good father? He Would was you... a great father. Okay. I mean, he was, my father was actually born in Lithonia, Georgia. Really? In okay. 1913. 
uh, which is a ways back. I was the last child of four. Uh, my mother told me I was a blessing okay. uh, when that happened. My sisters were two years apart, and then I was six years after the youngest. Uh, so he was uh, an extraordinary father, um, but he was not a caretaker father, because that's not what fathers were uh, in that era. How old was he when, he when your mother died? He was 50 years old. Oh, okay, okay. When she died. Okay. So he was, um, you know, certainly he had never imagined being 50 years old with a nine-year-old child to take care of. So, uh, so we made it, right? I mean, we made it and, and you know, things worked out. But, uh, you know, it, I, I, I have often thought, right, mm -hmm. about what life would have been like had there been two parents there. So that's kind of the, you know, the deepest level I can go to right. in terms of why would I be interested in this issue of all the issues one might be interested in. And, um, and that's, you know, that my mother's death was the formative experience. It will always be the formative experience of my life right. because it's not something that you ever, um, you know, it's as though you have a, uh, a, an injury that even if it heals, mm -hmm. it's, it's, there's still some remnant of it. Yeah, what was there's your relationship with her like? Oh, with my mother? Yeah. Um, she, uh, well, she had three girls and then she had a boy. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so <laughs> so okay. she lucked out. <laughs> she lucked out. And she, and she did let that be known. I mean, she was so, no, so she lucked oh, out. She was, um, you know, and it's only as I became a parent even that I began to realize that I think when she was sick and when she died, mm -hmm. the, um, only as I became a parent did I realize that the most difficult thing for her was actually to leave her children. Yeah, I can understand. <clears throat> And Want some water? No. Okay. 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 So, okay. Um, so, so no. So that's the type of mother she was. Okay. She was, um, she was all about her children. So, and that worked because my father was there as well, and so they were able to kind of keep it moving okay. when there were the two of them. Uh, but once she died, I mean, he was clearly rattled because it was just not. He was a situation that life had not prepared him for, mm. and. Uh, you know, he did his best, uh, but again, there were not a lot of home-cooked meals. Uh, I learned to wash my clothes and to dry them and to all that stuff right. very early. Uh, I often had a dirty uniform for basketball or something. So, so. let me ask you this. The, you, your book, Is Marriage for White People? Okay. Is marriage for white people? Answer ah, the question. Is marriage for that's white That's a rhetorical question. Yes, that you ask. So, yeah. So I'm now asking. Yeah, so the, so okay. the, so the question, <laughs> so the question it, so it comes from an incident in, in D.C. that a reporter wrote about where she went to a classroom and she was talking about parenting. And one of the, where well, she was talking, one of the kids said, well, tell, me, tell us about parenting. We want to know how to be good fathers. And she said, oh, great, I'll bring in some married couples to talk to you about raising children. And they said, no, 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 we don't want married couples. And then another kid said, yeah, marriage is for white people. And that shocked the writer, and it shocked me, because that's a, just a vivid expression of that child's perception that marriage had declined so much in Southeast Washington that black people didn't get married. Only white people got married. Uh, so I took that and used it as a question. Uh, and, and I wanted to have two meanings, uh, and people do interpret it in two different ways. Uh, one is, is marriage for white people but not for black people? Because marriage has declined the most among African Americans. But then second, is marriage even for white people? Because, yeah. you know, white people too get married a lot less now uh, than they used to, right? I mean, it's very much the case that throughout society, uh, marriage is no longer obligatory, right? I mean, people get married later, uh, they divorce more, they live together before they get married, so all sorts of things happen now um, that wouldn't have happened. Uh, 40 or 50 years ago. Uh, children throughout the nation are less likely to be raised by a married couple family than was the case uh, 40 or 50 years ago. So the book is meant to put in play both of those issues, both the decline in marriage among African Americans as well as a decline in marriage throughout the society. Well, tell me, 
why is why has there been a decline in marriage both among the a African Americans in, in such a big number and then among the rest of society as well what's what's driving that that uh, that right. number yeah well let me I'll give you a little longer answer than I usually do okay. since we have more time and there, there are two big factors uh, one is cultural change and the other is economic uh, change uh, and under the cultural change uh, in American society, marriage is much less of a necessity now than it has been, and that's reflected in all sorts of ways. Uh, uh, I'd look at changes in the law to see how the culture is changing. Um, and in the legal domain, it was the case 50 years ago, again, that being married was the only way legally to have a sexual relationship uh, and to live with someone uh, within the law. Uh, if one had a child without being married, the child had no uh, legal relationship or, or, or you know, no rights with respect to the father. The father had no rights with respect to the child. Uh, so there was a whole set of sort of legal rules that reflected this cultural centrality of marriage and having children and having an intimate relationship. And now, of course, that's all changed, right? People can uh, have children and then get married or have children and not get married or live together and not get married. You can do all sorts of things. Uh, so marriage has gone from being a necessity to a luxury. Uh, that's one part of the story. Uh, the other part of the story has to do with economic positions of men and women. And there, the short story is that when, is that women are doing better, but men are doing worse. And we see this especially with African Americans, uh, but throughout the society. Uh, the most shocking statistics, uh, and this was a book that was difficult to write, but the most shocking facts really have to do with the struggles of black men. Uh, one in 10 black men, actually more than one in 10 black men, in their 20s and early 30s are in prison nationwide or jail as we speak. Uh, one in four will go to prison or jail during their lifetime. That's nationwide again. Uh, at the other end, black women are nearly twice as likely as black men to graduate from college. So when we have that sort of gender divide opening, black women receiving more college degrees at the same time those degrees are becoming more valuable, uh, black men being left at the less educated end of the spectrum at the same time that, that jobs for less educated workers are drying up. Uh, that's not a recipe for success. And, and so that's, um, so those are the two big factors. Now, what in your view is keeping black women single? I mean, you, you say that we are the least marrying group. What is that? Is it, is it because black men are not doing so well, or what? What is what's driving? Yeah, I, I think that's again. So you know, people don't have to marry now, right? Marriage is a, a choice, not something you have to do. So some people will say, uh, you know, is it worthwhile for me to marry? And as men are struggling, uh, marriage seems less worthwhile to many. Uh, and for black women, uh, again, there's a uh, there is a shortage of men who are able to be the sort of husband that women want. Uh, only half as many black men as women, black men as women graduate from college. You know, one in ten are in jail. Uh, that obviously is not helping their economic prospects. So, uh, so black women have a small pool, and we've encouraged black women through in all sorts of ways to either or to only marry black men. Um, How and, have we encouraged black women to do that? I mean, why well, do black women tend to only marry black men? Okay, so that's a big, that's a big question, and there are a lot of elements to that. Uh, part of the story is that, well, part of the story, I mean, talk about the encouragement. Um, I think we do, we encourage in all sorts of subtle ways, uh, one might even say coerce in all sorts of ways, black women to remain with black men. Um, interracial relationships are, less uh, stigmatized now generally uh, throughout society. Um, but the strongest stigma that remains applies to relationships with black women. Uh, I mean, I've talked to black women even since writing the book. Um, you know, black women who are, have white husbands, say, who have uh, concerns about putting their spouse's picture in their office, um, who have concerns about putting their spouse's picture on their website, uh, especially when these are women who are race identified. Right, so they identify themselves as strong black women who are you know, down for the people. And there's this ever-present sort of accusation that 
you know, if you're down for the people, you don't, you know, partner with the man who's not one of the people. Well, is that different for black men, though? Well, that's one of the ironies here. Actually, there are a lot of ironies here, is that, uh, it, well, yeah, so it, it is okay, different okay. than black. Black men and women do feel differently about that. And, and in part, I argue this is, is basically a, a set of what someone calls sexist assumptions that were intensified during the civil rights movement when women were given the pressure for sustaining the family, uh, nurturing the group, raising the next generation. And this is something that women of all groups might feel. Uh, but for black women, it's been especially intense, in part because black women are doing so much better than black men. Uh, so there's a story, it was a story I don't mention in the book because I don't, didn't want to identify individuals, but there's a very prominent African American uh, in one, uh, that a, a woman relayed this story to me of a very prominent African American talking to her when she was in college. And basically she had a white boyfriend. And this very prominent black man just told her, you can't do that. You know, you, you're getting your degree. You can't leave brothers behind. And then for this person, this is just an offhand comment. You can't leave brothers behind. Come on. And this really had an effect on this woman, right? Because here's someone who you respect, who you look up to, who's giving you a sense of how you should structure your life. And I think we give black women that sense all the time that uh, their obligation is to form a strong black family, uh, partner with black men, uh, and as uh, Susan Taylor, former editor of Essence, said in print, she said, loving a black man can be like loving, welcoming home a war veteran, right? But if we're not there for them, who will be? And then she says, black love is the antidote to racism. And I think that captures a sense that a lot of us have, right? That black love is the antidote to racism, and that if black men are struggling, black women need to uh, assume the responsibility to help their brothers. And that ethos has a special pull. Do the brothers feel the same way? Well, no, they don't. That's I don't know. And black women feel that pull because they know that black men are struggling because these are often men in their own family, right? These are friends, cousins, bro literally brothers. And who wants to feel like you're leaving someone behind? One of the ironies, there are two ironies there. One is that black men outmarry two to three times as frequently as black women. And this may not be a surprise to anyone. Uh, uh, black men um, are much more likely to find a partner of another race. Uh, another irony is that, and this is anecdotal, I don't have or it's consistent, you know, systematic evidence on this, but in talking with people, some of the most uh, virulent opponents of interracial marriage by black women have been black men. Uh, and they express, you know, opposition for a range of reasons, but you know, a lot of the opposition is, I was telling someone earlier, that every phone interview I've done uh, on a radio show, uh, save one, uh, has included a black man suggesting that I'm promoting the destruction of the black family uh, by suggesting that maybe black women should expand their options the same way other groups have. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of uh, energy that black men expend uh, you know, a very, uh, one might have a charitable interpretation, right? The uncharitable interpretation would be a lot of energy that black men spend trying to uh, control black women to keep black women limited uh, so that black women don't gain uh, any more options uh, than represented by black men. What does that mean when you write in your book that black women would empower, need to empower themselves by, quote, marrying out? They would empower right. them. What does that mean? Right, so the idea is that, I mean, so a part of the problem with the marriage decline, because it's not just among the poor, um, we actually see a racial gap in marriage throughout the socioeconomic spectrum. So if you look at men who make $100,000 a year, say, um, black men are much less likely to marry than their white counterparts. Uh, Why is men that? Men in their late 30s. And part of the story, and it can be a lot of reasons, but part of the story is that because there are so many women um, and so few black men in that pool. Uh, the black men have a lot more power than the women do in the relationship. And one thing that men in general might use their power in a relationship to do is to not have a committed relationship. Uh, some people may find this surprising that men might uh, be less inclined to marry than women. Uh, as one friend put it to me, she said she feels, this is a black woman, she said she feels like women are always the deal takers, whereas the men are the deal makers. 
and that seemed to capture it. Deal takers mm -hmm. versus deal makers. And the men can be the deal takers because the men know and the women know that the men have more options than the women do because there are a lot more you know, attractive, beautiful, desirable black women in any given university, say, than there are black men in that university. So uh, well, let me ask you this. That leads to this, a this leads to another point you make. Many black women marry uh, college educated, blue collar, working mm -hmm. class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't seem to like that. Why? No, I don't dislike that. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Let me say, this is not, I'm not, I'm just the messenger. Okay. I'm the messenger. Okay. So, so what message, or, bring I'm, us the message. I'm the message, about. I'm just bringing the message. <laughs> I am just bringing the message. Okay, so, so what is the message we should hear oh, about that? I, I, should say, I should say, I actually will be, because I will be at a church, not in uh, New Jersey, okay. uh, in East Orange. People know that. Uh, anyway, but we're, okay. Uh, but no, so another striking thing that I discovered in the book is that you know, black women are, and this is a trend that's most pronounced among black women, but it's a universal trend, and women, wives now, are much better educated uh, and higher earning relative to the wives of 30 years ago. So now we see this among whites, where in 1970, say, 3% of wives earn more than their husbands, or 2%, now it's 25%. So about one in four women earn more than their husband now. But among African Americans, a majority of college educated black women who are married are more educated than their husband. A majority. A majority of married college educated black women have more education than their husband. Than their husband. In other words, there are many college educated black women who are married to non college educated black men. And this also may not be news uh, to many of you. This is seems likely if we have the two to one ratio in college graduation, which we do. And those relationships can sometimes work out, right? They can be great. You can find love where you can. Uh, but it's also the case that the data show that such relationships are more likely than other relationships uh, where the partners are on the so-called same level to be conflict ridden or to result in divorce. Right? And one, one reason is the economic reason. Uh, one of the strongest gender roles in our society is that the man earn money. Uh, we've, you know, a lot, women work and men can take care of children and we're very flexible. Um, but it is the case, and this again is based on research, that when the man is unemployed, divorce is much more likely than when he's not or when the woman is unemployed. When the woman is supporting the family because the husband cannot, problems are more likely to result. Uh, and that's because the people looking in on the relationship may have problems, right? Your family, your friends, your, all those people. Uh, the man may be insecure about a wife who makes more money than him. Uh, and it may even be that the woman, frankly, is not too happy with the situation either. Uh, because she might expect to have a husband who uh, mm -hmm. is a breadwinner as well. Um, so, that can result in, in problems. Yeah. Okay. And then there are other reasons as well, but, but that's just one reason that problems can arise. Are white men generally attracted to black women or not? Oh, I'll go out on a limb here. <laughs> you, you am I, am I, am I talking limb, loud enough now? <laughs> am, I, am, I, am I loud enough? If I'm loud enough, I would say more, more than we think. More than we think. What um, does your research and, and show? And I'll say, and, and, I, and I'll say, yes. So, this, so I'll say more than we think anecdotally. Uh, and what the research shows, that it's also more than we think. Um, the best available research, right? We have relates to internet dating studies, um, Match.com and so forth. And in all those studies, it is true that there's some portion of white men or non-black men who are not interested in dating black women. So that's true. Right? People are paying attention to race, and black women are not at the top of the list. But it's also true, frankly, that black men are not at the top of anybody's list either, based on these same internet dating studies. Right? And black men outmarry a lot more than black women do. So even after we take away the people who are not interested in dating black women, there are still, by any measure, and based on any study, there are still more non-black men who are interested in black women than there are black women. There are more non-black men who are interested in black women than there are black women. 
This is in part because so, black women are a small part of the population. Non-black men are a big part of the population, right? Not only whites, but Asians and Latinos and Middle Easterners and people from South America and I mean all over the world. So you're saying there's a huge pool, really? Huge pool. People have come here from all over the world. We have this mix. In places like New York, we have this huge mix of peoples and most of them are not black. Uh, and a lot of those men are very interested in black women because they think that there are a lot of desirable qualities about black women. And one little known tidbit, since we have time here, is that um, you know, a lot has been made of, a, of an OKCupid okay study that I talk about in the book, and it's received mm -hmm. an extraordinary amount of attention, right? And the media take on the study, and what the, the, the researchers uh, take on the study was that this shows that uh, non-black men are not interested in black women because, or, or white men. Actually, they said white men are not interested in black women because white men responded less frequently than they should have based on the uh, compatibility score the website calculates. calculates. But what the write-ups of the studies of that study never mention was that, in fact, there were lots of other groups also part of the study. Asian Americans, Latinos, Middle Easterners, and those groups actually responded to black women more frequently than did white men, and some of those groups responded to black women more frequently than did black men. Hmm. They responded to black women more frequently than what did black men. What groups were those? Well, we didn't go to <laughs> <laughs> in the book. Yeah, just, I'm talking about the book. Just kidding. <laughs> so let me ask you this. And one, two other questions, and I'm going to open it up and give everybody a chance. But somebody asked me to ask you this. So I'm gonna, can white men handle black women? That's a good question. Yeah. I think <laughs> it depends who you have, right? It depends who you have. I think that the, you know, there is, I mean, I, I, I will say that I mean, frankly, I don't know if black men can handle black women. Right. Um, <laughs> I'll just put that out there, right? And, that's, and that's, that can be a comment. That's a comment really more about the men than about the women, right? Uh, and one of the things that has been surprising to me, people say, well, what have you been surprised about? And the thing that's been most surprising to me is I get lots of emails from people, which, which means a lot because my email address is not that readily available. Um, but I get emails from people uh, in response to articles and, and interviews. And sometimes I get a very negative email about black women, which says, you know, here's what black women are doing wrong. And I, I think in almost every instance, that email is from a black man who clearly has a lot of emotional energy behind <laughs> the characterization, right, of what black women are doing wrong. Um, emails from white men and other groups of men and from women never have that sort of emotional energy directed toward black women. Uh, so part of the story of the book, right, is a way to, a story about how, you know, we sort of assume that if you're the same, that you have to be of the same race and that you should be of the same race and that black women should cast their lot with black men and that's the, and, and that way uh, they will find salvation, right? And the race will find uh, uh, salvation uh, through black women casting their lot with black men. But in fact, not all is well there. Um, there are some issues there. Um, we had the highest divorce rate by far of any group in the nation. Uh, less likely to marry, but more likely to divorce. Not a combination you want. 70% of children born to unmarried parents. So we have all of that stuff going on within the race, mm -hmm. uh, yet we you know, assume that everything is well, even though it's not. And then outside the race, when you consider that, people act as though that can never happen, right? That somehow uh, there's a boundary that can't be crossed, or you cross it only at your own risk. And I guess, in a very small way, what I'm trying to do is to cause people to readjust their sense of risk and, and you know, of, of, of benefit and drawback, right? To understand that there may be drawbacks to relationships uh, among African Americans, um, that there are some dynamics between black men and women that are not so healthy, uh, and a lot of that stems from this numbers imbalance. And then also there can be good relationships with people of other races. Uh, and we should be open to that. Uh, black women should be open to that in the same way that every other group has become open to that. So, uh, so that's the hope. So Rick, what do you predict the future is for the black family, say 20 years from now? I think it's gonna be a lot of different shades. Do you? I do. I mean, okay. I, mean I, I, think we're, I mean, I do think we're at a turning point, um, frankly, where uh, 
you know, when you think of interracial relationships, uh, I mean, I know people who are interracial couples who married in 1966 before it was legal in many places. Uh, and now, you know, they've been together all those years and they have children and their children are having children. And we've seen things change and those kids were okay, right? They turned out okay. Um, the last stigma I think we really have in terms of interracial relationships is black women. Um, you know, the number of black women who just report very negative responses, often by black men, is staggering. And uh, so that's a problem, but things are shifting so much uh, that I think that's gonna change very soon. The, the, the data that's most positive for me is that the, when you look at the polling data, uh, opposition to interracial marriage is still high among people who are in their 60s, say. But if you look at people who are in their 20s, they practically all accept interracial relationships, right? So, and that's the generation that's coming of age. So among today's college students, race does not have the same valence that it did even for me 25 years ago, much less for the generation before me. Uh, and I think that's a positive thing um, to have strong black families, but also for everyone to have the freedom to find love where they can to form a relationship that works for them so they can raise their children in a positive setting. Well, thank you. <laughs>